What's up guys, this is Carlos, and this is another tutorial video. My Facebook page is Scarlet and Sable. Um, a little while ago I started on the Dark Imperium box and I painted up the noxious, or I'm sorry, feeded bloat drone. And there was quite a bit of uh, positivity and requests for tutorials, so this is a uh, tutorial that I sort of said I would do uh, a few weeks ago and now we're gonna get to it the core of this uh, metallic is gonna be the scale 75 scale color metal and alchemy copper set um, this is a great set I like it probably better than the other two I've um, the other two being the steel and the gold set which are both great sets but I feel like I have a ton of great silver and golds already well maybe not necessarily gold but I definitely have a lot of silvers a lot of go-to silvers I already use so that set wasn't necessarily um, as much of a revelation as this is this color in particular this decayed metal I love this color because it kind of takes the place of the old uh, tin bits for me it does have some different properties it's uh, I believe the pigments are smaller though when people say that I'm always skeptical because I mean how can you really measure pigment size if you're not in a lab but it dries uh, matte, and it's uh, but it's also metallic, so it's kind of it's got like it's got a little satin to it, but it's more matte than almost any other metallic, and it ha it's very reminiscent of the color tin bits, so I like it. The uh, midtone being Victorian brass, and finally amber alchemy is going to be the uh, highest highlight, and the effect that I'm going to do is going to be like a very uh, beaten up and uh, kind of fast. It was supposed to be fast. I mean, you can you can sort of uh, do whatever you want after you lay down the base coat, but my objective was to do something that provided a fast uh, method to get to a really good base coat. And then, you know, if I wanted to go back later and really add some um, interest I could do that with other colors like glazes and washes so this is a couple of the other colors I'm going to use burnt umber and black are going to be the two uh, glaze colors that I'm going to add some interest with on the copper and really all that's going to do is going to make like a shade into the recesses the burnt umber it doesn't really show up but since I wanted to do a faithful rendition of that process I did that uh, the first time around I used the burnt umber on the feeded blow drone so I'm a, I guess I'm a slave to conformity and finally uh, I'm gonna use turquoise I also on the on the other miniature I used nihilac oxide but I will not be using nihilac oxide this time around I just want to um, this for this particular model I'm not going to go as hard and something that I mean not as a uh, I'm not going to go as in-depth with all of the colors I think that a lot of times people will see a recipe and they'll feel like they have to follow it to a T and a lot of like I don't know if you've ever uh, read any of the um, heavy metal master classes but they often have like all of these like weird steps in them they're like you know do two parts uh, agrax and one part you know griffin sepia and one part bad ab black and the warmth of the sepia and the this and the that of the you know agrax is going to counteract the the you know the, the sad feelings that the bad dad black is going to cause and you know a more cynical person might say well that's so that they can just move more washes so they can sell more paint because they do ask a pretty penny for their paint and let's be honest I mean we're talking about a 12 milliliter bottle whereas the industry industry standard seems to be between 17 I'd say about 15 to 18 milliliters and and not only that, but like once you do that, once you do that step, you know that that weird kind of uh, three part shade mix step, 
and I'm this is of course a hyperbolic example but it seems like there's a lot of unnecessary steps sometimes in some of those master classes and that's just again um, you know kind of a layman's perspective I guess so maybe they do add something so anyways the nihilac oxide this is a long way around of telling you that the nihilac oxide was kind of it felt like one of those steps yes you can kind of get more than one turquoise um, kind of uh, patina going on on your brass or I'm sorry or your copper this is gonna be more of a brass you can get more than one patina going and that's definitely a good thing however actually this bell now see I, I'm saying all this and I'm kind of explaining why I'm not gonna do it but on this bell this bell it has a lot of surface area so on actually something that is this size you can um, go with a few different maybe patina glazes to try to draw out maybe like an emerald mixed in with your turquoise to sort of add like interest to the surface because that's what we do when we add these glazes we're going to add colors into the surface so that it's not just you know a beautiful uh, looking bell you know it's got like lots of different color variation which actually kind of makes it more intriguing in my opinion and um so anyhow, uh, all I've done is I'm trying to get a good base coat of the decayed metal. And one thing about these paints uh, I should mention is that when you uh, start with these scale colors, try to do all the painting that you're going to do the minute you put the paint onto the palette. Uh, it doesn't really seem to... It doesn't really seem to have like a long half-life once it's applied to the palette. It sort of uh, dissolves into its uh, constituent components. Whereas like a paint like a... Uh, actually, see, I was just I just was bad-mouthing GW, but GW paint, if you put it onto a wet palette, actually kind of seems to hold its consistency, and that can be for days. So that's one, that's one area that I don't know if that was an intended outcome of when they uh, you know um, contracted for that paint but it definitely seems to maintain its integrity on the wet palette and you know not many paints do artistic heavy body paints do uh, the GW paint does maybe P3 but I don't use a lot of P3 but other than that um, like Vallejo just falls apart on a, on a wet palette it'll fall out the pigments fall out of suspension and like the medium seems to rise to the surface and uh, suck up a lot of water. I think it's maybe uh, uh, kind of one of the components in the paint is different than what they use for GW. Perhaps it's more hygroscopic. Uh, I think it that means it attracts more water. So the so this is kind of what I'm talking about. This decayed metal should be darker, and it's actually it's drying kind of. Um, almost like a lighter brassy color. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit it with the hair dryer. So I'm going back in, this is the third coat. We'll see if this uh, fresh application of this paint kind of, yeah, and I can see that the consistency is totally different. And the other, with the other drops that I had on the palette, I put them on there earlier today, and the paint had kind of uh, fallen out of suspension, if you will. And so it was just, it seemed like there was just a lot of the shimmery particles um, that I was picking up and water. There wasn't some of this flattening agent that seems to be in the fresher paint. So maybe that's what, uh, what I was kind of missing. I'll go back in, get a little water, a little more paint. Okay. So this is going to be, I think it's at an angle. Um, let me check against the other part to kind of see where um, it's going to be resting. So even though we have several coats on here, we've got approximately three coats. The water itself has evaporated, and what we're left with is this really nice dark copper. And so I said it looks like, you know, 10 bits. That's not quite right. It doesn't necessarily have, it's a little brighter than 10 bits, I'd say. What was I looking for? Oh, there, I was looking for that. I'm looking for the top of his backpack to kind of see what the angle is going to be. 
So it's kind of it's kind of when it's on the guy's back. Where is he? It's going to be sort of tilted towards us. So I actually almost have it at the angle um, that it's going to be at. So if I was uh, to imagine a zenithal light source coming from above, I think that this area right here, this kind of crossbar on top of the bell, this is going to be catching some light. Down here across this area is going to be catching light. I may favor towards the right side and also on these edges right here and perhaps like a, if you draw an imaginary line coming down the bell because it does have some cylindrical qualities that's also an area that we could hit this is kind of I looked at what somebody else had done with the feet of blow drone I kind of was evaluating uh, one of the things that I could do to speed up my painting and so I decided to try something which was just kind of a making a main highlight and I believe I saw this on nose NOH miniature painting channel and then he, once he got his main highlight area he kind of just expanded it outward ever so slightly by just dotting the surface and what we're doing with that is that once our main highlight is placed right here and up here and let's say down here along this uh, part of the bell all this area is going to be our highlight and then what we're going to do with these little dots is we're going to kind of break up the surface break up the highlight and we're going to kind of that is going to help us blend that in um, that main highlight in so we're going to go down here a little bit and then the further away from we get from the main highlight itself the less or the more sparse the dots will become so again up here along this edge we'll kind of hit a little bit of that I need to make sure I stay in focus and we're going to maybe hit some edges and I've started doing this as I as I work the miniature any sort of uh, edge highlighting that I'm going to be doing I do it at that moment I do all the steps that I'm going to do as close together as I can now there's different philosophies uh, as far as that goes like some people paint one area and they do it completely some people uh, put all the colors all the main colors they block so so called block in the miniature with all of the main colors um for me what i've started to do is i've i do um i try to do one area but i also like any edge highlighting i also like to use multiple colors along the edges and that way it makes it a lot easier so rather than uh and this is uh for me rather than going back after I paint this area completely and then getting kind of like all the colors that I used and sort of making a blended edge highlight so having a darker highlight color up to a lighter highlight color I edge highlight sequentially with every layer that I'm putting on there and then hopefully towards the end that will show up now I haven't done that uh, it's not as visible on this miniature uh, as maybe it would be on another but that's kind of something that I've been trying to do and actually I the minis that I was doing it on I really liked so now what I'm going to take is I didn't even say what color that was that middle color was our Victorian brass so now I've got Victorian brass and amber alchemy and I'm going to do the same thing and this is uh this is again this is going to be a highlight so I'm going to highlight the main area of um that I'm doing so smaller area than the Victorian brass highlight and then just a small part of this bell up here and then I'm going to start my dots up there and again we're going to we're not going to go as far and we're not going to do as much because this is a smaller highlight and if you get too aggressive if you uh, kind of oh I should draw that in if you overdo it what we can do is we can knock down a lot of this using washes and also uh, we could always just uh, go back in maybe with our, our mid-tone and knock down some of this extreme highlight. So these colors, and I find that metallics in general, it's hard to get really sharp highlights without creating a tremendous amount of contrast in the shadows using uh, matte uh, colored glazes. Unless there's a stark difference. So I think that it's unfortunately a necessity when doing true net non-metallic metal now I'm not like uh, my application of these colors isn't really necessary for it to be exact if I kind of slip 
and I get some of this color where it shouldn't be, it's really on metallic, it's just gonna kinda look like a scratch. And as I add my glazes, it's gonna incorporate it into the overall surface. So the scratch or the blemish or the mistake, hopefully later can be kinda worked into the overall scheme and made to look more natural. So now, <clears throat> That's our second highlight, and you see up here what I was talking about. To me, it looks like there's like a little bit of a, this uh, highlight kind of run amok, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stress out about it. I'm gonna work with it. I'm gonna my weathering is gonna try to help me get some of that back. So finally, my last highlight is gonna be amber alchemy, and I'm gonna only hit the most extreme areas right here. Maybe these two little guys and a little bit of that guy. Right here, dotting a little bit. Just hit the tips. And a lot of this this work is maybe invisible, so you're not going to necessarily see everything that we do here. But there's uh, the glazes again are going to kind of we can draw out some of the work that we've done and. Once we make the rest of the bell darker, these other areas are going to appear lighter. So, uh, I may go back and do some sides of the bell, but really uh, I'm focusing right now on this kind of this upper three quarters of the bell because that's sort of where my that's sort of where my light is going to be hitting. My light source is coming down and hitting these these guys right here. So, uh, I'm going to grab my burnt, I'm using burnt umber, and that's going to be my first glaze. And sometimes acrylic can be tricky, but uh, it dries quickly, so if you know that you're going to be doing something that requires you to work fast, just uh, it can help to have a second blending brush handy, or you just need to be real speedy. But again, this isn't really, I'm not... I'm not really worried. It's not critical that I hit this thing and get like a perfect seamless blend. I'm not aiming for that anymore. That was a that was me in a different time of my life. Now I want texture. Now I want it. Uh, you know, kind of more nuance. And you know, it's fine if you're a person who's struggling for that perfect blend. When I was uh, first starting, I definitely was. I was all about that. But like, I find that to be. Um, not as interesting anymore. I'm, I'm going for more of a um, varied surface. So again, I'm going back in. This is a second heavier glaze of burn umber, and I'm going to hit these shadows over here. I'm just going to kind of dab it in there. And something we could also do, now that I'm thinking about it, is if you wanted to uh, perhaps uh, make these highlights even brighter, even more um, standout-ish you can always get some silver but you need to be very sparing if you get the silver out because that's it could definitely throw the whole piece out of whack so let's see if we have time for that I'm trying to do um, tutorials that are shorter I just don't seem to talk too much okay so now uh, that's a couple burnt umber glazes now we're gonna take black and we're also gonna now this one of course is gonna go into more um, selective areas, darker areas, the darkest of dark areas. So probably maybe just along the outside edge of these skulls. Not too, not too much. Maybe under the, uh, this rim right here in the corners. And don't worry about, again, you don't have to hit every single surface. We're kind of not going for that anymore. We're kind of going for something that's a little filthy, a little grubby, and definitely tainted. And I forgot to say, this is kind of a, I don't know if I said it, the corroded metal. That, that was the effect that I did on the uh, feeded bloat drone. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to go for here. So I'll probably fill in these, uh, I'll fill in these little pits. You know, I can start here with some black and that'll, uh, it seems to help the turquoise show up against the black. You can just go in straight on the copper. I don't think it really uh, makes too much of a difference, but I like the, I like to put the turquoise over a little bit darker surface. 
So again, uh, get under here, and now we should probably let it dry a little bit. Um, I have a lot of colors in there right now. So I'm gonna do what I said I wasn't gonna do, or to be careful about, and I'm gonna get a little bit of silver. This aluminum is uh, a Vallejo model air. This um, is an exceedingly powerful color. It will override nearly any color you put it into. So you have to be very choosy about where you put it and also be kind of, uh, you need to look at your mix and make sure that your mix is not going to be overpowered by silver. The minute you hit the miniature with it, it doesn't matter what you really mix it with, you're going to see it. It's got a very smooth sheen to it and it's, like I said, it's got incredible tinting power. So you just have to be super sparing with it. I'm mixing it with Amber Alchemy. That's my highest highlight. Looking over my glasses, I'm trying to get a look at it. See that silver? I mean, that silver is like all I'm seeing right now. So I'm going to look at it on my thumb. And yeah, yep, that's definitely a highlight. So here we can see we've done some of the work here. You can see the shade over there. The shine is gone almost completely from that side of the bell, whereas over here there's still quite a bit. So uh, I'm going to use this amber silver mix. I'm going to use get the top of these uh, rivets. Go back and force it. Good, good dry. One thing about pointy brushes is the uh, you need to use the tip, and the paint dries out very quickly on the tip. Get a little bit more of amber alchemy. There's plenty of silver there. And there's other alchemy colors you can mix in. I just, I'm, I kind of know what I got with this Vallejo aluminum, so I'm trying to work with it, incorporating the colors that I'm using for my project. So this is more like a, since I have some knowledge of this paint, I'm going to try to use it. So that's one thing that um, I think I've talked about before and really something that's going to help is if you use these kind of keynote colors in your own work you'll see that any of the more successful artists in particular I can think of a couple like uh, Ben Comets and uh, well, I can think of one I guess Ben Comets but he uses like these same colors over and over that so much so that they've kind of become his signature so but they're a known quantity. So in his painting, he doesn't need to guess at what these paints are going to do. He, he understands the kind of tinting strength they have. He understands how they dry. And the other thing is, is that Vallejo has pretty good quality control. I haven't got two bottles of Vallejo that like one looked like it was, you know, red and the other one looked like it was like a dark uh, maroon. You know, they're, they're, they tend to have very close, uh, or they're, like I say, quality control. I mean, there is, you can definitely count on their products, but regardless, it is possible to get different colors. I've seen people post pictures online of two bottles from the same manufacturer that look uh, very different. So anyways, what I'm saying is, is that his bottle of, of paint is gonna be different than your bottle, even if it's just slightly. So anyways know your paint that's what i'm trying to say know your paint so again i'm just hitting some edges here i'm not getting uh too crazy i can dot that's one of the things that we do to also break up our surfaces as we create these textures even along the edges and that's going to add quite a bit of uh, realism these are going to look like little notches in this bell like stuff's been pinging off it and they've been knocked around and who knows what this guy's been up to. So just catching some edges here. And I'll probably cut it. I'll probably stop there. I mean, really, you, you got to know when to say when. <laughs> and I think that was a little while ago. Okay. Now, so I've caught some edges there. I'm not sure if it's catching up on the camera, but hopefully when we go back with our, uh, with our still images, we'll see some. So now the only thing I want to fix is I said we were going to fix this area with some glazes. Didn't quite work out the way we thought. So we're going to go back in with our mid-tone and our top uh, highlight color and we're going to knock it down. We're going to try to blend it into the surface. And this is 
Uh, despite what other people may think, when you work on a miniature, as long as your paint is thin and your plan is sound, you can go back and you can work these areas. You don't have to settle for that. Um, if you're, if you think everybody who's uh, on Facebook and the pros, like they lay down the perfect stroke every time, well, I, I don't know. I don't believe it's true. I know I sure don't. So just work with it. Don't, don't settle for something that you don't like. Wow, I must have gone in there real strong. So that's going to take maybe a little bit. We're definitely going to need to work with it. And all I'm doing is I'm applying that Victorian brass. And I'm just going to try to kind of blend it back in. So I'm going to get this time pure Victorian black brass. And maybe dab it in a little bit. Just dab it. Dab, dab, dab. Get it in there. And this brush, actually, this was a quote-unquote new brush that I uh, pulled out maybe a week or two ago, and it's already this kind of abuse. is not, is not good for these little pointy tips, but that's all right. That's what they're for, you know. We want to make, make our miniatures look great. Okay. So that's probably, uh, I can live with that. So as the final touch, just for this video, I'm going to go with some turquoise and I might I might go back later and work on this a little more but uh, I'm pretty happy with where it's at. I might actually darken up some of these shadows but you can see that shadow back over there on this side. I mean that is dark, dark, dark. Um, so what we can do is we can kind of get some teal there in the crevices or turquoise. Go around those and another thing we could do is we could add some scratches Ooh, maybe that's what we should do actually before before we go in with the vertigree let's let's do some scratches so we'll get our amber alchemy we'll see how that does maybe we'll do some some pits and some scratches over here in this dark area quick way to add a little bit of interest edge it, cover up these little rivets, or highlight them. We'll do the same, maybe draw some notches, and you can you can do that to your heart's content. The only thing is, is that when you're doing this kind of stuff, when you're doing these little, these little dings and blemishes, just make sure that you uh, consider the entire area that you're working on, and try not to overdo it in any one particular area because it's going to look pretty weird if you have like just every inch of it scratched up. That's one of the things that it's important to uh, kind of probably one of the more important skills and it has nothing to do with uh, putting a paintbrush on a miniature and that's uh, restraint and your judgment. We talked about that in another video. Less is more, so on and so forth. So we got some scratches. Maybe a few more dots, and then we'll go in with the vertigree, and we'll probably call it a video for now. Hit these guys, and if you want, you can use, you know, you can do the, uh, you can grab some black or some brown, maybe we'll try a brown, we'll try a brown and a burnt umber glaze, or not glaze, I'm sorry, we'll try a brown and black uh, mixture to do our scratch that will underline. So that's another way you can, um, you know, that's like an extra deep scratch. That's what we're doing when we're, when we draw these in here, we're actually simulating these scratches. So we can draw in, let's see, like maybe about right here, since there's already kind of a chip. Draw a scratch right there. And then, so our, our direction kind of disappeared on me. The direction of our light is going to dictate where we underline the scratch. 
So we'll go back in again. If the light is coming from overhead in this direction, which our highlight is, you can see the edge of this bell, it's kind of getting hit by the, it's getting hit by the light source. The, the edge that's gonna catch the light is gonna be on the far side, the far edge. And that's uh, important for these to look 3D. If you don't get the right edge and it's not consistent with the rest of your highlighting, it just won't look right. So uh, keep that in mind. And something I read elsewhere is that you start your scratch just slightly higher, or I'm, I'm sorry, your underline slightly higher than the scratch itself, and then go to the edge. So now we've added We've added that scratch right there. And if we want, you know, we can go back in and kind of firm it up, but that's pretty much how you would do that. Um, it's not the finest scratch, unfortunately, so maybe we would want to touch it up just to, you know, kind of not so it looks so uh, artificial. We kind of want it. And then if we want to add a further, you know, a further layer, if the scratch is deep or if we wanted to draw like a jagged surface maybe onto it, if we were creating a texture we could fill in a tiny portion of the scratch with uh, the turquoise so then there's three layers there's the edge that's been lifted or chipped off uh, that's bright there's the scratch itself and then there's you could put verdigris within the scratch so all of that is going to create that 3d that 3d texture that um, is so coveted. So again, we'll refine that scratch one final time, and you know, I'm probably overworking it now, and this is what we say we don't wanna do. So let's, let's apply a little verdigris, and then probably that should be it. So I'm just gonna get a very thin application turquoise like the silver a very strong color uh, you have to be somewhat judicious in the application and we're going to go inside of holes like the eye sockets maybe uh, you know, up around here on the edges uh, or I'm sorry around the uh, outline of the head inside of these um, holes inside of the bell and if you don't see your glaze the first time that's okay if your glaze does not appear strong enough after it dries, that's also okay. Uh, that's fine, actually. The opposite, not so fine. If you go in real heavy and it looks like it's been painted turquoise, that's the, that's the situation that's hard to rectify. The situation where it's very, uh, where it's kind of faint, that can be rectified with another thin application. So keep that in mind. And if we wanted, we could draw like a little streak right here. We could get under this rivet and then we could maybe do a little streak with turquoise. We could do another one. Oh. And I'm going to let that dry and I could do it again. And it's drying very quickly. I guess maybe it's hot or the paint is very thin. So do it again. And you can do that to your heart's content. If you wanted, you could do one over here. As long as we keep our paint thin, we can kind of work on it. We can do it. And what I've been doing uh, also is that if a, if you have a side that's not going to be visible, you can always practice on the, the other side. So on the back of this bell, you could paint the inside of it first. And, of course, that's uh, maybe more effort than some people want to go to. But you could do that. So now that's a considerably heavier application. So I'm just going to mop up with the leftover oh, water. I'm going to mop up the leftover, and then I'm going to kind of spread it out. And I'm going to do that all around the miniature. I'm just going to keep on doing that. So like I said, with this one, I could go in with a secondary application, maybe of Nihilac Oxide, and I'll just continue to do this. And this, to me, this is the fun part. This is where we start to um, kind of uh, draw, um, or I'm sorry, tell a story. You know, these streaks, this means this guy's been... You know, who knows how long he's been in the warp, uh, rotting away, um, you know, cooking meat or doing whatever he does with his apron. 
eating flesh. And so we'll just draw these light streaks that we got up onto the skull. And you can do that all around the bell. Um, and then another uh, another effect we could add in there if we were feeling bold is we can get a little bit of our uh, black glaze or black get it thin to a like almost a wash like consistency a little thinner than a wash but not quite a glaze we can go into these corner areas sorry about that we go into these corner areas kind of just Add in a little texture with the uh, black, these little dots. It's going to further emphasize the shadow and also cause uh, this kind of you know diffusion effect. It's going to break up that surface and it's going to look a little bit more blended to us, maybe. At least that's what I'm hoping for. I'll do that under here. And so you can also do that with your burnt umber and you can just start you know well, all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna keep going into the surface I might I might probably call it soon on this guy but I mean this is this is what you can do to your own miniatures you can add these little uh, these little accents and then hopefully towards the end you end up with something that is pleasing to you you know and if you cover up any of the work that you've done, you can always go in with another uh, edge highlight or something like that. So anyways, we have a bright side over here. We've kind of showed how to do a little bit of light streaking um, with the turquoise. And we've shown how uh, we can apply glazes to enhance the contrast of a metallic. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.